Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Stanford Blood Center. I'm Ross Coyle. I'm the public relations officer at SBC. Due to public health restrictions in light of COVID-19, Cafe Sci will be virtual for the foreseeable future. So tonight we come to you via Zoom. Stanford Blood Center is the primary supplier of blood products to Stanford Hospital, which is one of the largest users of blood products in the nation. Of all the blood centers in the United States, few others have a history that includes research. That research has always been a cornerstone of our mission as an organization, and many industry leading discoveries have been made here. And of course, our success would not be possible without our faithful blood donors, many of whom are watching this evening. A special thank you to all those who have been answering the call during the challenging times. We will be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so feel free to chat in your questions. I do ask that you turn off your cameras and turn on your mute. This talk is also being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel in a few weeks. We will also be doing a random raffle for the event. Tonight's prize is a AAA excursion road kit, courtesy of our donor loyalty store. We will ship the prize to the winner this week. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight for this very special Cafe Side presentation, The Mystery of Persistent Pain After Injury with Vivian Tofik, MD, PhD. Dr. Tofik is a board certified anesthesiologist and pain medicine physician who specializes in the treatment of complex chronic pain disorders, including chronic post-operative pain, complex regional pain syndrome, and peripheral nerve injury. Dr. Tofik obtained her MD and PhD in neuroscience with a focus on basic pain mechanisms at Dartmouth Medical School. She then moved out west to join the Stanford Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine as an anesthesiology resident in the Fellowship in Anesthesia Research and Medicine Program, or FARM, of which she now serves as director. After completion of her subspecialty fellowship training in pain medicine, Dr. Tofik joined the faculty at Stanford and continues to research the immune contribution to persistent pain while clinically informed basic science while also caring for patients suffering from chronic pain. Will you please welcome Vivian? Great, good evening everybody. And thank you Ross for that nice introduction. Um, I have no disclosures, although I might, um, if we have time, discuss off-label use of drugs. Um, and with that, I will begin. Um, as uh, Ross nicely outlined, I do split my time between clinical work and research, um, both of which is focused on chronic pain. And I wanna spend this evening talking to you about some of these interests and sort of bringing you into um, this world that I spend a lot of time in um, and sort of highlight to you why it's so complicated. So um, as many of you maybe know, chronic pain affects one in three Americans at a huge cost to society, recently estimated to be $635 billion in lost time and productivity as a result of chronic pain. One thing that I noticed as I began to treat patients with chronic pain was that there was such a variety of pain conditions that people experienced, but really we know so little about an individual pain condition and what actually causes it that we're really not able to offer mechanism-based treatment at this point. As a PhD trained basic scientist, I was really interested in trying to understand pain mechanisms better and really think about that in order to develop more specific treatments. So I wanna to talk to you a bit about how that works and in particular, a couple of um, types of chronic pain that I see quite a bit of and that I'm interested in studying in terms of mechanisms. But just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I think it's really important to think about what exactly is pain. And so if you ask that question to a neuroscientist, their answer is often, well, pain is about neurons. Pain is about, you know, a neuron that has, you know, a, a one side in, in the finger and then, you know, you touch a hot stove and that neuron sends a signal to the spinal cord, to the brain, and then you move away from the hot stove. And that's what pain is. It's really a neural process of encoding that type of noxious or painful stimuli. But there's actually a much more complex definition of pain itself. And that's that it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And it's this word experience 
that makes pain so difficult to treat and really so difficult to understand because built into the definition is a word that is really subjective. And so this isn't a definition that was come to easily. It was originally coined in 1979 by the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP. And then it was revised actually just this past year in 2020. And it, all the details aren't important, but the bottom line is that the definition really didn't change very much. Um, there's slight wording differences after, I think, probably a year of meetings that were convened about this. But really the important point, I think, that changed in this new 2020 definition were these notes that they added at the bottom. So they gave the definition and then they added these specific um, notes. And I just wanted to spend a moment sort of thinking about some of these and why they're important. And so the first two are really the ones that we're gonna focus on today. Pain is always a personal experience that is influenced to varying degrees by biological, psychological, and social factors. And I think that that really sort of encompasses a large um, sort of body of work, first of all, that pain is a personal experience, but also that sort of highlights why it's so difficult to treat. And so if we were together in person um, and not virtual, we could do an experiment such as this, where I would ask everybody attending the lecture to put their hand into very cold water, two to four degrees Celsius. So we're talking about 35 degrees Fahrenheit water, and everybody would have to leave their hand in that cold water for two minutes. And after those two minutes, I would ask each person to rate their pain on a scale of zero to 10, which is very similar to what you know, we often ask patients when they come to the clinic. And if everybody in the room tried that and then gave their score, the scores would be very different. And this is just sort of, you know, an example of what the data would look like where the pain scores are along the X axis and the number of participants along the Y axis. But this is truly what it looks like when you ask individual people to do something that's painful. The scores are all over because there's a lot that comes to the table when we're asking somebody to rate their pain. Of course, there's the neurons, that are actually sending a signal, but there's maybe you like cold, maybe you it reminds you of, of skiing, you know, when you were young, or maybe, you know, you hate the cold, or maybe, you know, you had a bad morning and, you know, you were trying to drive to somewhere and, and you were late, and then that's right when you were doing this experiment. So there's all these things that sort of come to the table and really um, bring in the biopsychosocial uh, model of pain. And you can see some people may rate it at a two, others may rate it at an 11. So if we go from there back to our definitions, um, the other important one I wanted to bring up was the second one here, that pain and nociception are different phenomena. Pain cannot be inferred solely from activity and sensory neurons. And so again, I presented to you right at the beginning that nociception is really defined as that connection of the neuron sending information up to the brain it's not everything. It's not, pain is not just nociception, but nociception is important because nociception does allow us to have a better understanding of studying pain and really trying to understand where pain signals go. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna ask if everybody could mute the line because I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Um, thank you so much. Um, so in, when you're thinking about the neurons that actually transmit this information, if there's tissue injury, for example, in this, in this schematic here, um, at the site of tissue injury, there is always inflammation. And inflammation is there really to try to bring in cells and to bring in the forces to try to heal the tissue. And so it's really important to have inflammation. The problem is that when inflammation persists beyond its use, it can then contribute to painful conditions or to poor tissue healing. And in that milieu where there's um, all of these immune cells that come in, there are also are neurons. And these neuron endings, the nerve endings here, um, come in to the tissue and then they send another branch to the spinal cord where they meet other neurons that then go up to the brain. And those ascending fibers actually allow us to perceive pain. And the other thing that's not depicted here, but is that there also are descending fibers that come from the brain back down to this area of the spinal cord called the dorsal horn, where there's a lot of interactions between neurons and other immune cells, immune cells that actually live in the spinal cord called glial cells, which are cells I'm particularly interested in. And all this interaction really allows some signals to make it to the brain and some not to make it to the brain. 
And so this neuronal system, even though it's not included in the entire definition of pain, is actually very important for um, the transmission of pain. And so why do we have pain anyway? What, what, why, what's the point of pain? And I think we learn from a very young age that at least acute pain prolongs survival. And we think of pain really as a warning sign. And that's really been brought up um, more and more clear. It's made, been made extremely clear by studying certain people who actually have the inability to experience pain. And this paper came out in Nature about 15 years ago now. Um, and it really highlighted that not experiencing pain is actually a problem as well. And so the reason this um, was so interesting was that um, there was a young boy, he was 10 years old at the time, who came to medical attention in Northern Pakistan where he lived because as a street performer, he would routinely do things that were extremely painful that anybody else would, you know, would never be able to do. And he would turn up for medical care for broken arms or injured limbs or other cuts and bruises, but he never complained of pain. And so in studying that, that particular patient and then studying his family, um, they were able to sort of home in on which gene had gone a little wrong and what gene had a mutation in it in this particular patient. And you can see here, this is a family tree that they had built or, or a pedigree chart where the squares represent the males and the circles represent the females. And you can see here are the patient that I'm describing is at the bottom and he's affected, which is why the square is colored in. But he also has a few cousins who have the same insensitivity to pain. And they also were able to identify two other families with children who had insensitivity to pain. And what you can also notice is that while the family tree starts off quite separated, it starts to converge. And so what happens here is there is overlap in terms of intermarriage within the family. And when there's intermarriage, there are often genes that can come forward that would otherwise not be um, very, they would actually be very rare, but actually become more common because of combined genetics or, or similar genetics between family members. And so by studying these three families, they actually identified a gene um, called SCN9A, which encodes a sodium channel. And that sodium channel is located on one of these neurons. And it actually allows the transmission of pain information from the site of injury to this area of the spinal cord where the information then goes up to the brain. And so even though nociception or the neurons are not the only story in pain, they really are important for being able to sense pain. And again, when there are conditions where you can't sense pain, when those neurons are not working right, then there are additional problems. And actually it's quite a dangerous, um, a, a, quite a dangerous condition. So that brings us to the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. So acute pain seems important for survival, that's quite clear. But why do we need chronic pain? Is that also important for survival? So it really brings up sort of the comparison, the contrast between acute and chronic pain. Um, so in the case of acute pain, as we just discussed, hurt equals harm and avoidance decreases damage. So you put your hand on a hot stove, you feel pain, you pull it away, and now you've avoided burning your hand or getting a serious burn. In the case of chronic pain, hurt does not always equal harm. And actually, if you start to avoid things, so for example, you know, you're supposed to be doing physical therapy to help with wrist movement, but you're avoiding doing it because it hurts, well, that can actually cause more stiffness in the wrist. And then you start to be afraid of moving. And then that can start a fear avoidance cycle where you're actually making it worse by not moving it. So it's a little bit more complicated in chronic pain. In terms of the etiology or the cause, in acute pain, it often feels like it's a very clear pathway. There's an injury, there's a broken leg, the physical exam is quite clear, quite obvious about what is causing the pain. In the case of chronic pain, there's a lot of unknowns. The physical exam may not be that helpful. We might not be able to actually see anything visually, but yet a patient may still have severe pain. It's really a multifactorial disease in a lot of cases, although I presented to you a case of one gene causing no pain. Um, there are examples of one gene causing severe pain, but by and large, we think it's probably the type of disorder that brings together many different factors and many different genes. And as I said, it also pulls in more of a biopsychosocial model where prior experience and you know, even things like poor sleep, increased stress, all these things can change the way that we respond to pain. In terms of treatment, there are also differences between acute and chronic pain. For acute pain, there may be a very specific and fixed endpoint, for example, the fracture heals. 
and that's it, treatment's done. Often in the case of a fracture, you might be immobilized, they might put you in a cast or tell you you have to walk with a walking boot. Um, and that's important for recovery. In the case of chronic pain, sometimes immobilization can actually make the condition worse. And this is something that I'll come back to. And then for acute pain, often medications seem to be sufficient. However, for chronic pain, we often really need to think about it in a more of a multidisciplinary fashion. And again, I'll, I'll touch upon that. That's really the mantra of our clinic is to really treat patients more holistically, not just with medications, but with psychology and, and physical therapy um, aspects as well. So one question that I often think about and that I think is really important is you're sort of trying to figure out acute versus chronic pain. So the question is, when is acute pain no longer acute pain? And some people say the definition is, well, if pain has lasted more than three months, then it's no longer acute pain. But really, in my mind, it's all about trajectory. So in general, patients should be improving and not worsening in the weeks after an injury or a surgery or a trauma or anything that causes acute pain, it should be lessening. And if that's not the case, then it's something that we should think more about as being the potential for chronic pain. So in terms of the type of chronic pain that I'm particularly interested in, as an anesthesiologist, I spent a lot of time in the operating room during surgeries, and I would see patients and care for patients undergoing surgery. So it's really a form of chronic pain that as an anesthesiologist, I was quite interested in. Um, and it's defined really as pain that lasts more than three months after surgery. So again, there's always a time component, but it's variable and you could find many different opinions on whether it's three months or six months, but essentially it's pain that outlasts the length of recovery expected for the given surgery. Um, it's usually localized to the surgical site itself or to a referred area from that surgery. Other possible causes are excluded. So for example, if there's an active infection, then we wouldn't necessarily consider that chronic post-surgical pain, but we would say that's related to the actual infection. It's not present prior to surgery or it's different in character. So it's something about the surgery itself that triggered this, this pain and not something that the person came to um, the surgery with. And this is really interesting in that it's reported in a really variable number of patients depending on the surgery type. And so at the low end of 5% um, is actually um, chronic pain after cesarean section. And this brings up a very interesting topic, which we don't have time to get into tonight, but the idea that in general, women are more susceptible to chronic pain conditions, and yet they have the lowest rate of chronic pain after a surgery that is only done on women. And so there's a lot that can be sort of brought in there, but it's probably, it is the only surgery where they hand you a human being immediately after. It's a very different kind of surgery than any other type of surgery. You know, you get it when you have your knee replaced, there, there's, no, there's no new baby involved. So obviously, um, you know, it's kind of a different scenario. But in general, the things that are more commonly done and where we do see high levels of pain um, orthopedic procedures are pretty high on the list. So for example, total hip arthroplasty, total knee replacements, these are surgeries that are done hundreds of thousands of time a year, times a year in, in the US alone. And the number of patients suffering from chronic post-surgical pain after is estimated to be up to 23% in hip surgery patients, up to 34% in knee replacement patients. And in the case of distal radius fracture, which is essentially falling on an outstretched arm and fracturing either one or two of the bones of the wrist, it's a very high proportion of these patients, again, about 30% who have pain at one year post-fracture. So this is not something that um, is uncommon, actually. It's quite common. And so then it brings up the point of who is at risk. And so really, there are many people who are at risk especially those who have a history of chronic pain who end up going into surgery. But one thing that's interesting that one of my um, colleagues in the pain clinic studied, um, this data here is from Ian Carroll, where he shows um, taking all patients who come in and then looking at their pain score on day one after surgery. If it was greater than three, they're indicated here in the red line. And if their pain score on day one was less than three, this is on that pain scale of zero to 10, so if they had a pain score of less than three on day one, then they were much less likely to have pain. So again, on the y-axis is the proportion of patients who have continuing pain. And on the x-axis is time. 
And so those who had a day one pain score of less than three, about maybe 15% of them still had pain four months after surgery. But those who had a very high or a higher day one pain score had about a, a two to three fold increased risk of having continued pain. And so that's quite striking. And it brings up a lot of questions about, you know, is it that those patients had some sort of complication of their surgery? Is that why they had more pain? Is it that they came in with more pain? Is it that they were more sensitive to pain? Was their pain not treated as well? There's so many questions that can come up from that. But it also is a flag for us that if patients are having poorly controlled pain in the post-operative period, that we do need to pay special attention to them. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit because there's a lot of, there are many patients who suffer from chronic post-injury or post-surgical pain, but not all chronic post-injury pain is the same. And I'm just gonna give the example of a patient of mine who is a 28 year old female who twisted her ankle. Simple enough injury probably has happened to many people who are listening in, I know it's happened to me. And instead of it getting better, and again, this gets back to this idea of trajectory, instead of it getting better, she continued to suffer from severe pain swelling of her foot, redness of the foot, and warmth of the right foot. The left foot, nothing, it was totally normal, but somehow this right foot had completely changed and frankly didn't even look like it was belonging to the same person. And through my time in the, in the pain clinic during my training, I started to see more and more of these patients and started to learn more and more about this condition called complex regional pain syndrome, which is what this woman suffered from. And complex regional pain syndrome, or CRPS, is a form of chronic pain that usually affects the limbs, so hands and feet, arms and legs, after really a minor trauma or a small surgery. So again, as I said, in the case of my, my patient, she had just twisted her ankle. Some other patients come in having a distal radius fracture, some of the things we just spoke about. Um, and some don't even really know what it was that may have triggered um, their pain syndrome. But there are very specific criteria that have been developed for the diagnosis of this, of this um, condition, CRPS. And so when you see them here, there are, different er there are different categories of symptoms that we see. So there's a sensory category where patients come in with pain. Clearly, most patients who come to the pain clinic do have pain. Um, but there's a very specific kind of pain I notice in patients with this condition, and that is touch-related pain. So patients will come in saying, you know, I can't wear a sock on my injured foot, um, or I wear a fuzzy sock, like something really soft, or I have to sleep with my feet outside the sheets because just the touch of the sheets on my feet is extremely painful. So that touch-related pain, or allodynia as it's called, is a, is a major factor in CRPS, more so than in other pain syndromes. We see um, pseudomotor changes. So we might see swelling that outlasts what you would expect for that kind of injury. Sweating changes where we might have one hand that's quite sweaty and the other that's normal. Nail or hair growth changes. And I think you may have noticed, and I can go back here, that the nails on her, on her injured foot are really quite different from the nails on her uninjured foot. Um, and then you also see temperature and color change. So patients will say, my foot is so hot all the time. It's burning up or it feels much, much cooler than the other side. And it changes color, it may go from red to blue to purple. The other thing we see are motor changes, including loss of range of motion and even tremor, weakness or contractures, where you see that, the, for example, on a CR, in a patient with CRPS of the hand, you could see a contracture of a pinky finger that you know, is unavoidable. You can't open that contracture. The tendons are really very um, tight. So CRPS can also be, besides being defined by these different categories of symptoms, can also be distinguished based on the cause. And so we call type one uh, CRPS that where we've identified no major nerve lesion. So again, we talked about these nerves being involved in nociception. In some cases, we can actually detect a nerve injury in some of these patients. And we call those CRPS type two, when we actually can either through imaging of some sort or through other means, we're able to detect a nerve injury. Or for example, they had a nerve surgery, like for example, carpal tunnel release. And so we know that the carpal tunnel was released. We know the nerve in, in the wrist was operated on. And so in that case, we would say that they were a CRPS type two if they developed symptoms after that surgery. The other way that we can distinguish CRPS is by phases. 
So there's this concept that in the early phase or immediately after injury, there's more of an acute or peripheral um, red hot swollen phase, where if you took a biopsy of the skin, you would actually identify increases in skin cytokines or inflammatory substances in the skin. And in that phase, that acute phase, which lasts about a year or so, depending on the patient and depending on the situation, that phase is more responsive to treatment. Then there's this shift towards this more chronic or what we call a central phase, where the limb may become cool, um, shrunken, atrophic is a word for sort of a shrunken looking limb. And if you sampled the skin, you would no longer find the increased inflammation there. But if you sampled the spinal fluid, you would see an increase in cytokines or these inflammatory substances in the, in the central nervous system. And that phase is more refractory to treatment. And so as you can imagine, it's really important to try to either catch patients early or try to treat them early so they do not progress to this more chronic phase. While I said it starts at about a year to shift, it's really quite variable and it's definitely not so cut and dry that in a year things change. All we really know is that as time goes on, patients are more likely to present with this more cool and atrophic um, presentation compared to patients who are early on in the course of the condition. So I just told you that patients come in with a red hot swollen hand or foot and there's a lot of inflammation there. And for those of you who may have injured yourselves at some point in, in your lives, you may have had a red hot swollen hand or foot and then it got better. And like I said at the beginning, inflammation is part of healing. And so this has been described thousands of years ago now where there's heat, redness, swelling, and pain as well as loss of function associated with an injury. So why is it that I'm calling this red hot swollen hand a problem? Why is this an issue? And again, it gets back to the idea that it's all about trajectory. Patients should be improving and not worsening in the weeks after an injury, a surgery, or a trauma. Back to the idea of chronic post-surgical pain. If a, a surgeon, for example, does 100 or 200 carpal tunnel releases a year, and then they see a patient back at six weeks and expects to see the patient you know, back to moving, feeling good, happy about the surgery, but there are a couple of patients who come back and they're like, you know, I just don't know, it's still hurting, my hand is still so swollen, I can't really move it. Those are patients who are a little bit off trajectory and who really warrant further attention. So in terms of clinical um, considerations for CRPS, it's not a very common disorder. Um, only about five to 25 cases per 100,000 per year or about 50,000 new cases per year in the United States. That said, I think it's probably under-recognized and under-diagnosed, again, because of this confusion where it looks like normal healing. I mean, it looks like, okay, well, there's just inflammation that's expected. And by the time somebody picks up on the fact that, wait a second, it's taken six months, nine months, a year, and they're still red hot and swollen, um, then we start to think, oh, maybe this is not normal. So I do think it is under-recognized and under-diagnosed. And I think that that's something that, you know, certainly I've been trying to bring more attention to and giving um, lectures to surgeons and sort of saying, you know, if somebody seems off trajectory, just send them over my way and maybe we can just take a look and make sure we don't miss um, the acute phase for this patient. There are also certain risk factors for the development of CRPS. At the beginning, I also mentioned that um, women are just more likely to develop multiple different pain conditions. CRPS is no exception. There's at least a three to one, if not a four to one um, ratio of females to males. Certainly a history of trauma or surgery does make patients more likely to develop CRPS. There are some genetic underpinnings. So just like there are genetic underpinnings to the insensitivity to pain, there are some known genetic factors that can contribute to the development of CRPS, although it seems to be a little more specific to CRPS that presents with um, problems with movement, with motor symptoms rather than um, some of the other symptoms we see. And then the other factor that's really interesting is this concept of cast tightness after injury. And so again, many of these injuries tend to be orthopedic. In many cases, they're casts that are placed. And if a patient complains of cast tightness, it seems to somehow predispose or be a risk factor for CRPS. And so I just want to spend a moment on that because I do think it's really interesting and sort of wondered myself how that ever sort of came to be known. 
And so what happened was about 20 years ago, this group um, in Europe did a study to look at the effect of vitamin C on the development of CRPS after risk fra wrist fractures. So as I said, very high risk, falling on an outstretched arm, you fracture your, your um, distal radius, and then they put you in a cast. And so they did this study just to look at vitamin C and they took patients and gave them vitamin C or not. And then this is just one of their data tables where you can see here, 18 patients went on to develop CRPS, 101 patients did not develop CRPS. You can see here the, the gender split and everything else. But interestingly, they listed here complaints in plaster. And so again, this is a European um, publication, but plaster meaning a cast. Um, and so for patients who develop CRPS, 67% of them had complained that the cast was too tight. In the case of those who didn't, it was much lower, only 18% of them complained. This group then about 10 years later went on to study this even, um, again, they were again, they're still interested in vitamin C, um, but they asked the question again of, you know, how was the cast? Did you think the cast was too tight? They also showed that vitamin C was useful in decreasing the risk of CRPS. But to me, the really interesting finding was that you had an almost six-fold increased risk of developing CRPS if you complained that the cast was too tight. And so this is one of those situations that's a bit like the chicken and the chicken egg. Um, so is it that the person who places the cast does it exactly the same way every time and that the patient was more swollen than expected and therefore the cast felt too tight? Or did the person placing the cast actually cast them too tight and then that somehow predisposed for this condition? And the answer is we don't really know. Um, and it's, it's really a hard question to be able to answer. But um, I think the important point from this and something that I really try to, to teach my fellows and, and, and students who work with me is that we really do need to listen to our patients because what they perceive, something like cast tightness, needs to be taken seriously and acted upon. So if a patient's coming to the ER every other day saying, you know, there's something wrong, this cast feels too tight, we need to do something about it, open up the cast, investigate further and try to understand why. So from these experiences and from the knowledge I gained from working clinically, I was really interested in the idea of back translation. So bringing these ideas from the clinic back to my lab, which is a basic science lab where we model some of these um, pain conditions in mouse models and really trying to understand them well enough so we could then make discoveries to take them back to the clinic. And so I coined this term clinically informed basic science. And this is where I spend a lot of my time thinking about things like CRPS and trying to really understand the mechanisms. So the mechanisms are complex and I'm not gonna go into them really um, tonight, but just to say there's certainly a component of the peripheral inflammation which can occur at the site of injury, the central inflammation that can occur in the spinal cord where these cells, microglia and astrocytes or glial cells as they're known, can also contribute to inflammation and can actually cause sensitization of these neurons. And then very interestingly, there's also a situation in CRPS that is almost like a stroke-like hemineglect. So you may have heard of or seen patients or maybe even experienced yourself a stroke where you just are unable to acknowledge one side of your body. And this is very well described after stroke, but after a CRPS-like injury, something similar happens where let's say you injure your right hand and you can no longer use it and it's red hot and swollen and it's quite painful. So what do you do or what does your brain do? Your brain sort of ignores the right hand and you just become a left-handed individual who does everything with their left hand. And so there is this change in the way that your brain perceives that other hand. And it's actually the focus of some of the physical therapy maneuvers that we do for patients with CRPS. So my lab spends a lot of time thinking about this scenario of this transition that occurs at about a year in humans from the acute peripheral where there's this red hot warm swollen limb to this more cruel and chronic phase where there's pain but not as many of those inflammatory features. And we're really focused on trying to understand where this inflammatory component comes in and how it can be targeted to block this transition. So I'm not gonna speak more about that tonight because I'm, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on my clinical interests. 
But just to say that um, if you are further interested, you can visit my lab website to learn more about the work that we're doing um, in this basic science model. So I'm just gonna shift gears for the last um, 10 minutes or so of the presentation to talk about how we can distinguish the cause of peripheral pain. So I talked to you at the beginning about how, you know, I, I came to the clinic, I really wanted to do mechanism-based treatment. I was a scientist, but I'm also a doctor and I'm really trying to, struggling to, you know, get it right with my patients and be able to figure out what is wrong and how I can best treat them. And so, you know, we would do a history and I love taking histories from my patients because to me, the story of how somebody got injured tells us so much about the potential underlying cause. And you really sometimes have to listen. I have a patient who um, I saw who had uh, leg pain and you know the story was just like, oh, she developed leg pain a long time ago. And I said, can you tell me what happened when you actually got that leg pain? And the story was much more complicated and involved a very heavy motorcycle falling on her leg and her sort of bracing, trying to stop this very expensive and heavy motorcycle from hitting the ground. And in thinking about that mechanism and what could have happened and what muscles she could have injured, we could sort of get to a more specific treatment because we had a more specific mechanism. And so the history can be very important. Sometimes the physical exam can be helpful and sometimes not so much. We can block some of the nerves that are involved maybe in the pain pathway. We can measure some of the nerves using something called nerve conduction or electromyography. We can also use imaging. And this is something that's become more and more important to pain physicians in recent years. And actually, um, I was lucky enough to work with, a, and I continue to work with a wonderful group that we call the NERVE team, um, where we brought together pain physicians, radiologists interested in nerve imaging, um, uh, peripheral nerve surgeons who are either plastic I surgery saw, or neurosurgery. I, I, I saw the birds that were there too. Oh, I don't know if they were talking to me, but I didn't quite hear. Um, but um, on also physical therapists and psychologists, again, with this more holistic view in mind. And so in thinking about that, we were really interested to know how can imaging help the pain physician? Again, pain is subjective. The physical exam doesn't always make the diagnosis clear. And there are many, many nerves and there are many muscles and there are many tendons. And so we don't always know what may be generating the pain. And so we were lucky enough to work with um, Sandy Biswal and Emily Lutz in the radiology department, who were getting very interested in a technique called MR neurography, which was really touted as an approach to be able to see pain. And the details are not as important, but the idea is that it's like it's an MRI as you would do for a spine or for a brain, but it's done in a way that really allows you to have high contrast to be able to see those nerves as they come out of the spine and as they run down the legs or run down the arms. And so if you have a patient who comes in with a totally normal spine MRI, but they continue to have severe pain, they have maybe um, difficulty moving their foot or their arm, or you suspect that there could be a lesion to the nerve, this is something that can be helpful. It does require expertise because you really have to have an, a, a radiologist who knows peripheral neuroanatomy and their challenges because these nerves are tiny. The sciatic nerve, which is the big nerve that runs down the leg, is only about seven millimeters. So we're talking really small structures. And you really have to have a group of radiologists willing to sort of back and forth with you um, to get better at, at, at doing these kinds of scans. What do you see when you do these scans and why are they useful? So what you can see is here, this is just a cartoon of muscle vein artery and then the nerve here. And what you can see is that in patients who have some sort of injury to the nerve or inflammation is that you can see a brightness of the nerve. And so that's, I defined here as increased T2 signal, which is just the kind of signal on the scan. But basically you see brightness of the nerve, you can see muscles that change, you can see a change in size of the nerve, or you can see it do something different. We had a patient the other day who, the, one of the nerves made a hairpin turn, which nobody had ever seen before. And of course, we were very suspicious that the nerve should not be doing a hairpin turn. And then that might be part of her problem and part of her pain presentation. So we put together this nerve team and over the course of the past five or so years, we've been meeting together and going through patients um, who have a more complicated history and who we really are trying to hone in on that etiology of their pain. What is causing their pain and can we get to a more specific diagnosis? So what we did is that we took patients who were seen either in the pain clinic um, with myself or my colleague, Dr. Carroll, 
um, or were seen in the plastics hand um, clinic or neurosurgery with limb pain. And when we were not sure about the cause of their pain, we referred them to have the specific scan, the MR neurography. And then we would go through the scans at a biweekly meeting, the nerve team conference, and really try to figure out from there um, further workup and plans. And so just to present to you some of our, our patients in general who we've cared for. So we summarized our data. We saw 58 patients through this mechanism. Um, about a third were male and um, most were in the range of about um, 35 to 60 years old and had had symptoms for years. So nine years on average. So this is a really high proportion of patients who've been suffering for many, many years from their pain conditions. Often we are sort of the third or fourth physicians who they're coming to see. So these are not straightforward situations. In the case of which limbs were affected, the lower limb was primarily affected in, um, in, in two thirds of our patients. And in terms of the initiating event, you can see here many of the things we've already talked about, surgery, trauma, fractures, sprains, or sometimes even unknown. So you can start to imagine that some of these patients are coming in with a diagnosis of CRPS and some are coming in with diagnoses of, of chronic post-surgical pain. From there, we looked at what types of diagnostics we performed. So of course, 100% of them had MR neurography. That was part of our criteria for being discussed at our nerve team meeting. In some cases, we would actually inject local anesthetic and block the nerve that we thought might be involved and make it numb and see if their pain improved. About half of the patients got these um, nerve conduction studies to look at, at the electrical signal in the nerve. Standard MRI, these are often patients who came to us with an MRI already done in the past. And then we have a research study, PET MR research study that about a quarter of the patients underwent. Interestingly, the findings on neurography we had no findings in about a third of patients, but many of these patients actually had some pretty significant changes, including changes in signal, um, nerves that got bigger, looked more swollen than they otherwise should have, deviation of the nerve, as I described, a hairpin loop or something like that, or actually being compressed either by scar tissue or something else. And what it looks like here, and um, this, so this is basically a cross-section through the thigh, and this is the big femur bone here. And this is what a normal sciatic nerve looks like. Hard to see, I have my pointer on it, but it's the arrows pointing to it. Um, but then you can see here, somebody who has a sciatic neuritis or an irritation of sciatic nerve, it's right here now, and it has these white spots in it. The radiologists say this lights up like a Christmas tree, but I'm not quite as convinced. It's not quite a Christmas tree, but it is brighter. And you do start to see these little dots within, within the nerve. And that is not normal. That's not what a nerve should look like. So the interesting thing we found from doing these evaluations and discussing as a team what we thought might be going on is that we were actually changing diagnosis. And this, wasn't in, this, this was happening quite a lot. So you can see here on the left-hand side, the diagnosis which the patients came with, and then along the top, the diagnosis after the evaluation with the nerve team. And you can see that many patients came diagnosed with type one, CRPS type one, which is the one where there's no identified nerve lesion. But after evaluation, they actually shifted into a type two, meaning we were able to identify a nerve. CRPS not otherwise specified, meaning most of the time it was sort of a, a type one, they didn't name a nerve. In that case, we also were able to change four of those patients to a type two, meaning we again identified a nerve. So in 58, or excuse me, in 78% of the 58, um, we were able to change the diagnosis and in those cases change it to something more specific. After that, we looked at what treatments we provided. So in almost all cases, we provided medication changes, physical therapy that was focused on the injury we identified, as well as pain psychology to allow our patients to incorporate coping strategies, strategies to decrease stress and improve sleep, things like that. Some patients received infusions or other treatments, but the key thing here that's interesting is that in about a third of these patients, we actually offered them surgery, which is not a commonly um, use treatment for this kind of pain, but because we were able to identify a specific nerve involved and an entrapment or a compression of the nerve, surgery seemed like actually a good option, and many of these patients actually improved their condition, which was 
you know, of course, a bit of a leap of faith for everybody, because if surgery brought you to the chronic pain, then it's hard to imagine surgery is going to bring you out of the chronic pain. And it's certainly not always the case. But in a small cohort of patients where we really honed in on this cause of their pain, it did make sense to offer that as a treatment and was successful. So all that to say, I really think having this kind of multidisciplinary team is really um, sort of the way of the future. And that if we have a specific diagnosis, we can provide a more specific treatment to really help patients, especially those who have complex pain. So with that, just to summarize, pain is complicated. Um, acute pain is not equal to chronic pain. Um, and there's a reason we have acute pain as a warning sign and chronic pain. We're still trying to figure out why we have it and how we can treat it better. In terms of the condition, complex regional pain syndrome, um, it often occurs after an injury to the limbs and really has a prolonged post-injury trajectory that needs to be recognized as, as a problem that needs to be intervened on. And I think the future is really mechanism-based and multidisciplinary treatment, which we are working together on. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the NERVE team, the radiologists, plastic surgeons, pain physicians um, who have been working with me on this team, as well as my research assistant, Emily, who's just done a fabulous job of keeping us all together. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions now um, or feel free to email me as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tofik. We really appreciate that. That was a wonderful presentation. We do have a few questions coming in on the chat. And uh, for those that are still with us, feel free to chat in your questions. We have about 10, 15 minutes left. So we'll start things off with uh, Ola has a question. I began having painful spasms following a bilateral mastectomy in 2016. It is intermittent, no pattern and no one area, but rather randomly th uh, throughout my torso. It comes on when active or resting. It lasts for a few minutes to a few hours, but will move from one point to another. Changing positions does not help. It feels like something is squeezing my insides. I'm worried about further damage. My physicians provided no explanation or resolution. I persist in trying to find relief. What type of specialist can determine a diagnosis? Yeah, so I mean, it's really hard to give specific um, medical advice, just sort of hearing the story. Um, I mean, first of all, I'm sorry that you've been suffering with that. That sounds really difficult. So, um, I mean, I would say, I, I, again, I, like I right away go into doctor mode. I'm like, what kind of doctors have you seen and what kind of tests have you had? But, um, but yeah, I would say, I mean, certainly seeing a pain physician would be um, important. I would say um, thinking about, you know, seeing somebody who thinks a bit outside the box um, would be probably a good thing. And I think that it's a little bit hard. Sometimes um, people are very rushed. And like I said, I love taking histories, but it takes a really long time. And insurance doesn't love us taking histories <laughs> um, because it takes time. Um, so I'd say, you know, maybe start with um, a, a tertiary care pain clinic where they have the time to really hear through your story and hear about the treatments maybe you've already had or some of the workup you've already had. And they can think a little bit outside the box about what else might be warranted in terms of the workup um, imaging, for example, or other treatments that can be, um, can be thought about. But in my mind, I mean, the way the story sounds, I would start with pain medicine, but obviously I'm skewed because I'm a pain doc myself. Um, but the other people would be like neurologists sometimes are also very good with peripheral nerve. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from Art. Does the long-term practice of the injection of steroids, cortisone, into joints to treat joint injury suggests the importance of reducing the immune system reaction to pain? So in general, steroids are, pro are tricky drugs because they definitely work. They definitely decrease inflammation as suggested by the question, um, but they have off target effects. And by that, I mean, they can cause immune suppression um, and they can cause um, you know, weight gain, difficulty with sugar levels and all sorts of other things. So chronic steroids as a possible like long-term treatment aren't really viable. And so what we've looked um, to rather than that is um, 
is trying to come up with other immune modulators that don't have as many off-target effects. If you think about it, steroids are like a really general treatment, they just suppress all inflammation. And so we're really trying to be a little bit more specific in finding things that, you know, don't suppress the whole system, but just suppress the problematic cells, for example, rather than all the cells, because the steroids can also cause bone loss and bone thinning and things that, you know, are actually can worsen pain rather than improve them over time, of course. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from Peter. I realize this talk is focusing on post-trauma or post-surgery chronic pain, but what about chronic pain due to genetic conditions? Does much of what you're talking about transfer to it or is it fundamentally different? No, so I would say um, a, lot, a lot of it does transfer to it. Um, just seeing the rest of the question that also um, the person's mother had the same symptoms. So there definitely is a genetic predisposition to pain in general. And some of it does um, relate here in that the likelihood that it's like one gene, like the way I was talking about with the, um, uh, with the in insensitivity to pain being one gene, it's very likely that it's many genes causing most people's chronic pain, except for a very few types of chronic pain that are truly genetic. Um, there's something, you know, there's some, some couple of them, but those are extremely rare. So in general, when somebody has, you know, what it considered to be like a predisposition to chronic pain, as in many people in the family have it, it's probably many genes that cause it. And so as a result, you're, it kind of ends up being the same thing, which is we're still trying to figure out which cells are involved and how we can treat it more specifically. Um, often we're not really looking at the genetics at this point, although I suspect in the future we will be looking more at the genetics, but it's, it's so complicated with chronic pain because there's just, it's gonna be more than one gene. And my guess is it'll be hundreds of genes that predispose to chronic pain. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from James. Have surgical interventions and non-pharmaceutical devices for alleviating chronic pain been improving in the past decade? How would you characterize their progress and which approaches do you think show the most promise? So I think right now the, where everybody's sort of like getting more hopeful is in neuromodulation, um, which is um, essentially placing wires either up against the spinal cord itself. So I talked about the nerves coming in from, you know, from the hands or feet and then coming to the spinal cord and then placing wires um, in the spinal cord space or just outside the spinal cord space and sending an electrical signal to the spinal cord itself. And there are different forms of that neuromodulation. Um, and that seems like, so basically like for, you know, it was developed like maybe 50 years ago. And then for a long time, there was nothing changing. It was like there were a few systems available and they were all about the same. But I'd say in the past five years or so, there's really been a huge burst in activity in terms of different ways of stimulating different electrical um, signals being sent to the spinal cord and finding out that actually those do different things depending on how the electrical signal is sent. Um, and so it's actually shown much more promise, I think, in recent years is that space of neuromodulation. Um, and I think that's probably where, and so those, but those are, um, I don't know if that was the exact question, but that's where the devices are going, are these implanted wire type devices. Um, the other thing is that we are um, also in Stanford, we've been doing more of, which is not just putting the wires in the spinal cord space, but actually putting the wires up against the nerve itself in the periphery. So let's say, you know, you have a, a nerve here that we identify as being problematic. We actually implant a small wire under the skin, and then you wear like this band-aid thing that sends an electrical signal through the skin to the wire. And that stimulates the nerve. And so you're getting a really specific signal, a really specific treatment to the problematic nerve itself. So either peripheral neuromodulation or central spinal cord neuromodulation seems to be kind of where things are going right now. Thank you for that. So we don't have any more questions on the chat, but I will open it up. If anybody wants to unmute and ask Dr. Tofik their questions directly, uh, we can do that now. We're coming up on the top of the hour. So one question uh, for doctor uh, is related to chicken gunya. Uh, it's a viral mm -hmm. disease transmitted by the mosquito bites. And was thinking that, you know, uh, again, uh, especially it is uh, affecting the joints, chronic pain lingers a lot longer. And I was thinking, is there any suggestions or ideas to reduce that, uh, the span or the longevity of that pain? I'll appreciate your answer. 
I'm sorry, I may just need to clarify. So are you saying um, pain in joints that occurs after a viral illness? That's exactly right. Uh, okay, chicken okay. Pain is a tropical disease, yes. Oh, okay, I'm not familiar with that. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I mean, uh, so just sort of extrapolating from others, so, so there, there is this, um, so CRPS presents, as I said, but it also comes with like a constellation of related disorders. And one area where it has some overlap is in something called chronic fatigue syndrome. And chronic fatigue syndrome is thought to be, um, in some part at least, related to chronic viral illness. So it could be, I don't, I don't know about the specific one you're talking about, but there are some other conditions like chronic Lyme disease that can cause like chronic fatigue and whole body pain and sort of a, a symptoms that we can't really figure out. And it's sort of these mysterious symptoms that occur. And so, you know, when there is either a low lying um, viral or bacterial infection, there have been people who've been treating these, um, especially in the chronic fatigue clinic with antivirals and antibiotics and having some benefit. So sometimes that can be helpful. If it's specific to a joint though, it's, it's often really hard to get those medicines into a joint because they're pretty um, enclosed and not very vascular. And so sometimes it does require, you know, like um, intra-joint injections of those types of medicines. But um, yeah, I mean, I would just say that some of this does pertain to that. Um, but in a way, I think um, chronic viral infections are like their own complicated world of immune, of, of like a low lying immune reaction that can cause a lot of other symptoms like fatigue, abdominal pain, headache, migraine, things like that, that we don't quite understand. Thank you, doctor. We have time for one more question. If anybody would like to unmute and ask their questions directly to Dr. Taufik. I have a question. Okay to ask? Go ahead. Please. Yeah, this is more for my older brother. He's had chronic back pain for at least 15 years, he's 86. And I was very interested in what you mentioned about that wire on the spine. Because a week ago, he just had uh, a uh, test of it and uh, it really helped. So then they took the wire out and then now he's fighting because insurance won't cover it and it's pretty expensive, 50K. Yeah. So I wonder, does insurance, wouldn't insurance normally cover such a chronic, uh, pain thing like especially the the wire um, uh, treatment you said for back pain severe back pain long going yeah so so my I question think, in general you know yeah no it's a really good question and unfortunately it's like it's an it's an, a constantly moving target so there was a time when they considered the what's called neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulation um, experimental and um, they would say, well, we're not going to cover it because it's too experimental and we don't cover experimental treatments. But there have been so many studies now that have come out about spinal cord stimulators, especially for back pain, actually. So for back pain and for CRPS, this condition I'm, I'm interested in, the data are actually pretty good. And so it's not really considered experimental anymore. But then you have some insurance companies that haven't either updated their coverage or whatever it is, and they continue to deny patients um, coverage for these treatments. So um, you know, all I would say is that sometimes it just takes like perseverance on the part, unfortunately, of the patient to like call the insurance and, you know, figure out what needs to be done and, you know, all the T's that need to be crossed and I's that need to be dotted and they don't, you know, they don't often make it easy. Um, but sometimes you can circumvent a denial, especially if he had a good benefit with the trial period. Um, you know, that's the best evidence is like evidence in the patient himself that he had a benefit from this treatment. Um, you know, and that it could avoid a surgery in somebody his age, that's extremely important. So bringing all those things to the table to try to get the insurance to reverse the denial, um, you know, can happen and does happen, but it does require some perseverance. Thank you, everybody, for those wonderful questions. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Taufik, for taking your time today. We certainly appreciate such a wonderful presentation. Thanks again, and thanks for everybody for tuning in for tonight's Cafe Sci. Keep an eye on our website, stanfordbloodcenter.org, for the next scheduled Cafe Sci event. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>